This is Doug Stout. It's December 17th, 2014. I'm here with Jesse Canoy. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jesse, where were you born? Uh, Columbus, Ohio. Uh, raised here in York. Okay, you told me though that, why were you born in Columbus? <laughs> uh, we were on our way. Uh, my uh, biological father uh, was on his way over to Columbus to pick up his paycheck. He was in the Army at the time, or actually his payroll. They didn't have checks back then. <laughs> And uh, we had a bad ice storm, and I was born in the back seat of the car on the way. <laughs> so what was your birth date? Uh, March 22nd, 1950. And nice storm on March 22nd? Yep. Yeah, can't ever be too late in a year, huh? No, spring's a bad month, but <laughs> sometimes I wonder the way my moods are. Maybe that don't have something to do with it. Um, and then, so you grew up around here, and then when did you go in the service? Uh, I was drafted in uh, September, actually on September the 18th, 1969. And then when did you have to report? Uh, that was the day I reported. Oh, that was the day you that had to report? Day, yes. Uh, in June, June of that year, I was taken for my uh, induction physical. Okay. And uh, then I was drafted on March the 18th. I had to report to Fort Hayes on the 18th. Okay. And from there, they sent us to uh, put us on a plane to Fort Jackson, or Columbia, South Carolina. And uh, when I got to Fort Jackson, uh, there were too many of us. They didn't have enough room for everybody, so we counted off, and they split us in half. And, and uh, part of us got on a bus and went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia. Okay. That's where I took basic training at Fort Gordon, Georgia. Now, that was Army? Yes. Okay. Yeah, old World War II barracks. It was cold. You could lay there and see the, <laughs> through the cracks in the wall and watch the snow blowing in. And, oh, my gosh. <laughs> there was no, no insulation, no nothing. I mean, it was cold in there. <laughs> I guess. Um so how you were there? What six weeks? Uh, eight weeks. Eight weeks. Eight weeks. They, uh, they were training us for uh, infantry. Uh, all the all the basic things, I guess, that you need to know. And, uh, it was rough. I mean, it was kind of the, the war was. I don't know. I I kind of think it was more the peak right around sixty nine between sixty five and probably about seventy two. It was it was hit pretty pretty heavy peak. Right. And uh, they. Uh, there wasn't a minute went by that you didn't hear somebody say, if you don't do what we're telling you to do the way we tell you to do it, you're not going to live to see the next day. And uh, that kind of sticks with you. I mean, that's still stuck in the back of my mind today. Oh, I'm sure. It kind of bothers me. That, uh, lost some good friends over there. So so you're training thinking you're going to Vietnam. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's no doubt in your mind that's where you're going to end up. Yeah, that that's, I was pretty certain that's where, where I was headed. I was scared to death. I mean, I'm not going to deny it. <laughs> it's, oh. it's a rough pill to swallow. Right. Uh, 18 years old or 19 and headed for Vietnam. And uh, hearing all the nasty stories and seeing the news clips and stuff, it's it's pretty tough. Did When you were drafted, was there any doubt? Was there any thought that it would take off to Canada or anything for you? No. Uh, I thought about a lot of things. I even thought about suicide. And I said, it's not worth it. I said, heck, if I'm going to die, I might as well do something worthwhile <laughs> anyway. So uh, I, I just went ahead and did what I had to do. And, uh, well, there was a couple of times in basic I thought about trying to hurt myself. And I said, well, I said, that's not going to do nothing. It just cause more trouble and prolong things. Right. So uh, I went ahead and uh, did what I had to do. And, and I guess the Lord was shining down on me because when the orders come out, they sent me to Fort Bliss, Texas to be a missile technician. Now, did they split everybody up then? I mean, yeah, that you did yeah, basic, everybody so. had different orders going to different places. Some of them went to communication school, some went to uh, mechanic school, uh, which was what I was kind of hoping for, wanting to be a mechanic. But, uh, I ended up going to uh, Fort Bliss, Texas, went into the, the uh, that was called the basic cock missile back then. Pretty simple little system, very efficient. But uh, I went into that, trained for eight weeks on that. And of course, as the Army would have it, when I got my first orders, uh, I came down for orders to Korea. Uh, I was supposed to be going to uh, a, a unit, 7th Battalion, 5th Air Defense Artillery. And when I got to Fort Lewis, Washington, I was held up for two, two extra weeks. And uh, I asked them what was going on, and they said, well, we were going to send you to Vietnam. They had the, uh, I believe it was the second of the 55th ADA, uh, was actually in Vietnam. It was the only Hawk missile unit there. And they had problems. Uh, 
high moisture with all the monsoons and everything, there's a problem with the electronic equipment plus the foliage would grow back so quick that they they couldn't keep a, a clear firing line to, to fire these missiles. So uh, they were pulling them out of there, and, and I guess I got lucky in that respect. That right. I ended up going back to Korea where I was supposed to go initially. Uh, it's kind of uh, kind of ironic that when I got to Korea. Uh, after all this missile training and everything that I had done, first thing they asked me was, can you cook a hamburger without burning it? I said, well, I think so. And they said, well, good, we need cooks. <laughs> so <laughs> I went in the mess hall and cooked for uh, about the first three or four months that I was there and, and was actually made acting uh, mess sergeant for a little while. Uh, mess sergeant there had, had a, a problem, had to be sent back to the States for medical problems. And, and uh, they couldn't find a replacement for him, so. For about three or four months, I was a cook, and then after that, I started driving the carrier truck back and forth from uh, the village of Unchani to uh, Chunchan, that was where our base battalion headquarters was at. And uh, so I did that for several months, and then uh, I decided to re enlist. I said, Well, you know, this army thing ain't so bad after all. And, uh, so, just like any other job, you just when you go to work, you don't know when you're getting off work, right? And uh, so I decided to stick around, so I took Took the big plunge, it took six years, and, and uh, re-enlisted and stayed in Korea. That extended my tour an extra month for the re-enlistment. And uh, I met a girl there, and we ended up getting married later on in life. But, uh, had a couple of sons. And, uh, the oldest one went into the Air Force, but he had a uh, old football injury. His back was injured playing football in mm -hmm. high school. And, he wanted to be a pilot, and that didn't qualify him for pilot school, so yeah. he uh, ended up going into fire training, and uh, he enjoyed it, and today he's a fire arson investigator in the city of El Paso, down in Texas. Neat. And the youngest went on to be a computer consultant and minister. <laughs> so, I'm proud of both of them. That's right. But uh, back to the Korea thing, it was it was a lot of fun in Korea. Uh, there were things... Uh, I was watching a video last night of uh, old Robin Williams in Vietnam <laughs> and uh, Good Morning Vietnam and it reminded me of when uh, uh, one of the guys was in the 7th Infantry Division at Camp Kaiser, which is where we were stationed at. Uh, they had American Forces Korean radio network there and uh, one of the broadcast stations there and I helped do the country music segment. Okay. I'll put the show together and everything. So I did a little bit of that on the, on the side. Nobody was supposed to know about that, but <laughs> I don't guess it matters now because it's not there anymore. In fact, I found uh, found a map upstairs here in the library that uh, showed some of the more modern uh, advancements that the Koreans have made. And Unchani it looks nothing like it did back oh, then. Bad. It's all modern buildings instead of the little stick and straw and, and uh, mud fences. And, and uh, it's really really big. I don't. I couldn't even tell you where the camp was at anymore. You can't even tell where it was. So uh, We moved. Uh, I was there from 19... I think I got there in February of 1971 and uh, left in April uh, 1972. And uh, midway through the tour, our tactical site stayed there, but they shut Camp Kaiser down. They moved the uh, 7th Infantry, I think, was going to Guam or someplace. I forget where they were sending them to. Right. Uh, second Division was still on the DMZ. Uh, we moved back to a place called Camp Beavers. It was halfway between Unchani and uh, Camp Casey, and I can't remember the name of the village there. Uh, seemed like Yandong Po or something like that. I can't remember right offhand. Right. Uh, we'd moved back to Camp Beavers, and uh, that's where I finished my tour up at. But uh, we were stationed on a place, it was uh, Hill 31, pretty certain of that. Uh, it overlooked the DMZ. It was a little further away than I, than I thought it was. I found some maps that uh, I was able to measure uh, using their guidelines there that they had. And, uh, we were actually 17 miles instead of 7 miles from the DMZ. And, uh, but we were still able with field glasses. We could sit there and look back and forth across that DMZ and see movement and stuff going right. on. And, and uh, so it was pretty interesting watching some of the drills that they did. They had a, a huge gun in a mountainside set back in a, in a cave or a recess in the mountain. And 
every day they'd roll this thing out before crew drills on it. It had a barrel. That thing must have been a half a mile long, it looked like. I mean, it right. was huge. <laughs> and uh, it was pointed right at us. I mean, <laughs> it appeared to be. You know, we always wonder what happened if they ever fired that thing. Uh, I figured probably half the top of the mountain would just <laughs> disappear, you know, I mean, gun that big. Right. Uh, we had some incidences there. Uh, we caught a couple of infiltrators. Uh, found some tunnels on the mountainside where they had tunneled in and were lower down on the mountain and come up through the side and, and uh, was trying to get into the tactical site. And uh, that was that was pretty interesting. And uh, actually we caught one of them, uh, actually half cuckoo birds in Korea, which I didn't know until I was there for a while, but I kept hearing this and, and I thought, what the heck is that? And the guy told me, yes, so they have cuckoo birds here. So you hear them all the time. Well, one night I heard this cuckoo bird, and I was on guard duty watching the perimeter fence, and uh, I said, it's nighttime. The birds aren't awake at night, and that's when we captured one of them North Korean infiltrators. Wow. They had actually been in the fence, was on the way back out, with, had some schematics and different things, some of the manuals, wasn't anything classified that would have done much good. Right. But uh, they still had it regardless. Yeah. And, and it made us wonder how much stuff did they actually get out that we didn't know about. And, uh, Anyway, uh, we caught a couple of them, so that was, that was interesting. And then, uh, I think the highlight of that whole whole tour of duty in Korea, my first tour there, was uh, the night that we went on high alert. Uh, we actually armed the missiles. We had a Korean MiG, MiG-17, was headed straight down MiG Alley towards Seoul, coming down from up near the Chinese border. And uh, he was moving right along. And uh, we were requesting permission to fire, and we kept getting orders from the battalion command that says, hold fire, hold fire, hold fire, so don't do anything, hold fire, so you can't fire unless they fire at us, and all this kind of stuff. And we're sitting there thinking, this guy, by the time, by the time they give us permission to fire, he's going to be the soul and back again. <laughs> and uh, all of a sudden, the, the blip just disappeared off the scope of the warplane, and we couldn't figure out what happened. There was no trace of going out, so apparently nobody fired a missile, but they called for an ammo count, and everybody called in a full load of ammo, and, and uh, they, they finally, the next morning, it they come out what had happened. But, uh, there was a North Korean major, had family in South Korea, and he wanted to be back with his family, and he had defected. Oh. And he was flying a plane down there. He just bailed out and just let the plane crash in the mountainside. And uh, that, was, that was a pretty, pretty healthy event. I mean, it got the hearts beating a little bit. It did. <laughs> made us think about our job there, you know, and how important it is, because it's not very far from where we were at in Seoul. I mean, Seoul's up pretty close to the, the DMZ to start with. And I didn't realize that the Unchan was as close to Seoul as it was. I was thinking it was a little bit further north. But, uh, uh, one of the things that uh, was interesting in that area was uh, our Bravo battery, Bravo 75, was the highest free world tactical site. They had to use helicopters to transport troops up and down off the mountain and equipment, supplies and whatever. Uh, it said that the, uh, there's a mountain, I can't remember what the, I can't remember the name of the mountain, but I remember the village the name was Kapion. And if I remember right, I think that's where Pork Chop Hill was at. Okay. And, uh, and I drove past that every day, and you could sit there and look at that mountain. It had snow on it just about year round. Wow. And it was, I mean, it was way up there. I think it was somewhere around the five, 6,000 foot level, something like that. And uh, for us, I mean, we were only, golly, I think, about 2,600 feet above sea level, something like that. So we weren't near as high as they were, but uh, we had uh, four batteries on the northern side of Seoul. And then down closer to Seoul, there was another battalion that had four missile batteries with the Hawk. And then just south of Seoul, they had four more batteries batteries of another battalion down there and uh, well, we did have uh, I guess that was the second time I was there but we had a pretty good little thrill that uh, sort of alarmed us I was stationed near Osan this was in 1976-77 okay. uh, we I was stationed in a little village called Sungani it was just to the uh, west of uh, Osan and we were on duty and Radar operator, the van operator, the van watch, he sounded the siren and everybody hit their stations. And they said there were 
four, five, seven, seven unidentified aircraft coming in. And they weren't responding to the IFF, so it said they were not friendly. Right. And that was another time we didn't actually arm the missiles, and by this time we had the improved Hawk missile there, which was a lot better system than the older one. Uh, we, we didn't actually arm the missiles yet, but uh, we were told to hold off until we seen what was going on because of the way they were flying, they were kind of coming across the Yellow Sea, but they were flying along the coastline. And so we didn't know if they were North Korean, Chinese, or what they were. And uh, so they kept telling us, just wait, just wait. And pretty soon we got the word to stand down. They said they were uh, ROK soldiers, the Republic of Korea soldiers had been on maneuvers. And some reason nobody got the word that they were supposed to be out there doing these maneuvers. Wow. <laughs> and we nearly, I mean, we could have easily shot them down. <laughs> Very yeah. easily. I guess so. And, uh, I mean, seven of them, that's, you know, really makes you stop and think, you oh, know, just how fast things can, can turn around on you and you know, how important it is to be alert all the time. But, uh, I enjoyed it. I really had a good time in Korea. It was uh, a beautiful country, really. Uh, people were nice. Of course, the GIs, they know they got money, so right. <laughs> that makes a difference too. But most of the people were pretty nice. Uh, my first wife's family, uh, they were pretty prominent in the uh, village of, of Seoul or in, in the city of Seoul. They were in uh, one of the suburbs, Yangon uh, Po, I think was the name of it. Uh, no, Dong Dishan, that was the name. Her brother owned a uh, jewelry store, and her mother owned a little market, a little food market. So they, they were considered prominent. Because of the, the it's out of bounds. Hmm. I don't know how you remember all these village names. And oh, it's it's not easy, <laughs> but I, after you've been there twice, you kind of get to know them. Of course, being that I drove truck around there a lot, too, I just learned, learned all the names. But uh, yeah, it, was a, it was a beautiful country. Uh, not much vegetation there. They keep the mountains pretty well cleared off, especially up north. Uh, it may be different today. I haven't been back there since the 70s. It'd be interesting to go back sometime. I thought about taking that uh, thing to Washington, D.C. I've been, been looking into signing up for that. The honor flight. Uh, the honor flight, yeah. I, I think I'd like to do that. Yeah, yeah, I think you should. It's a good program. I think you'd enjoy it. I lost a lot of good friends in Vietnam. Went to school with a lot of them from the community here. That some of them I didn't know. Right. Uh, wished I had. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we lost. I think there were thirty-eight. I think from Licking County. Quite, that we quite a few. Yeah. So, so so you went to Korea for the second time, and then you, did you finish your enlistment there? Uh, no, I came back to Fort Bliss. Well, in between, I went to Germany. That was a beautiful country. Uh, I was stationed at a uh, little town of Bootsweiler. We called it uh, beautiful downtown Burbank. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little farm village, and it was, it was above Trier. And it's uh, the oldest Roman built city in Germany. And right. Maybe all of Europe, I don't know. It's, right. it's, it's an old city. It's been around for a good many years, but they've done a lot to, to preserve it, and it's really beautiful. Uh, very close to Luxembourg. I was like 10 minutes from the Luxembourg border. Uh, used to take people on bus tours on the weekends. For lack of anything better to do, I'd just get a bus and load a bunch of people up and take them to go see the wineries and the river boats and the, the, the villages, go to some of the old castle ruins along the, the Moselle River. And, uh, tried to make myself useful while I was there. Learned a little bit about the history of myself in the process. <coughs> So it, was, it was kind of interesting. I mean, Luxembourg, you can almost spit across it, and it was a, a, a country. <laughs> I mean, right. It's kind of hard to believe that it's a country and, and be that small. And uh, I went into Belgium one time with a friend. Him and his wife invited us to go for a ride. I didn't know that it existed. I don't know that I could find it today. But uh, I remember we went through Luxembourg and into Belgium, and there was a, a village there called USA. And I'm not certain, but I think that was the crossroads where Patton got out and directed traffic. Okay. Because there was a tank, a Sherman mm -hmm. tank, with Patton standing beside of it, 
at this crossroad and had an American flag on it. And they named the, named the town USA. Wow. That's and, cool. Uh, I wish I'd gotten pictures. I had pictures of that, but uh, when my first wife and I separated, uh, she sold all my camera equipment. I don't know what happened to all my photographs and stuff. They disappeared. So uh, I wish I had all that because I had a lot of pictures of the castle ruins and things from Germany. I was boxes full of pictures. <laughs> wow. But, uh, anyway, I was in Bravo 262, and our primary uh, coverage area was Bitburg Air Base. And uh, Headquarters, battalion headquarters at Spang Dollum. I don't know if it still exists. I wouldn't think it's probably still there. But, uh, I enjoyed the duty there. It was. We didn't do anything. I mean, we didn't have half the excitement. We did have did one night uh, about all oh, two thirty, three o'clock in the morning. I got a phone call from the first sergeant. He said, "You need to get down here right away. So get the, the training filters out of the mask and get the wartime filters in." What's going on? And he says, uh, there's been a report that the Bonhoeff gang is in Bitburg and they plan to release nerve agent. They have it, so they've got nerve agent and they plan to re release it. Okay, <laughs> we did. Uh, we did have one little thrill there, but outside of that, it was pretty uneventful. I mean, we, about all we could do is if we saw one of these foreign national cars with the diplomatic plates, we had to report it and let them know that we'd seen it where it was at and what time and, and uh, they were allowed to drive around and uh, they'd come and take pictures of the tactical site. They couldn't see much. It was an old Nike Herc site so it had all these berms up around <laughs> everything. Uh, you couldn't really see anything. But uh, we had a pretty good time there. And, uh, I don't know. Uh, How did the Germans treat you? Oh, they treated you like one of the family. Really? Uh, everybody was great. I mean, if you walked up and knocked on somebody's door, the first thing they do is bring you in and, and offer you something to drink, use the alcohol, <laughs> uh, and, and try to feed you. I mean, that's, that's just the way they were. I don't think that they, they really appreciated the U.S. A lot of a lot of people had the misconception of Germany because of Hitler. That was Hitler. That wasn't. You can't you can't blame the whole country for one man's actions. I mean. There was a lot of people there that was doing just like we were in Vietnam, was following orders. Right. You know, and, and that, that kind of bugs me today, and, and I've put some people in their place over Vietnam about, you know, that these guys didn't want to be there to start with. I said they were fighting an enemy that they didn't even know who they were, just like they are over in the desert today. You don't know who the enemy is. I said, at least in the First and Second World War, you knew who the enemy was. They right. wore a uniform that you could identify who they were. Yep. Everybody, each country had their own uniform. I said, today, you don't know. And uh, I said, you know, you just can't win a war like that. There's no way. And, uh, and I said, that those German people, they appreciate the fact that we come in there because we not only liberated France, but we li liberated those people. They, they had their freedom back to live their lives as they want to. Uh, so they, they appreciate that. And I said, a lot of people just, you know, because of that misconception with Hitler, they, they think bad about the Germans. Well, we also saved half half of Berlin from the Russians, and that wouldn't have been good at that time. For right. The Russians to have gotten through Germany and taken it. Yes. It would have been would have been bad on them. All I was, of them. I was glad to see that wall come down. That was, I'll bet. I never got up to see the wall. I wanted to. They wouldn't let us get that far up. I said, it's too dangerous. And I said, no, you can't go up there. So I didn't get to go. <laughs> didn't get to see a lot of things because we was in the field most of the time. Thing about it, there's a lot to see, but not much time to see it. How, how long were you in Germany? About three years. Oh, okay. I was there from uh, golly, August, either August or September of '72 until uh, December of '75. I came back. Yep, had one son had dual citizenship. He was German American, and the other one was Korean American. <laughs> <laughs> So then, so from Germany, you went back to Korea. Yep. And then when when you went got out of Korea at that time, what happened? Uh, I went back to Fort Bliss, Texas. Okay. I actually came down on orders again for Germany. And at that time, the way it was explained to me, that if I hadn't made E6 by the time I hit 13 years in the military, which I already had 10 in, uh, if I hadn't made E6 by the time I hit 13, I'd have been out anyway. 
And uh, I'm sitting there away to that. Do I stay another three years or do I just go ahead and get a career started now? And I chose to go ahead and get out and start driving truck, which was a big mistake. Uh, I wish I could go back and do it over. I'd stay sure. in the military. And if I'd have read between the lines, uh, I don't think it was a mistake. I got a letter from my sponsor in Germany at my new unit, and it was addressed to sergeant, as in staff sergeant, you know, and not buck sergeant type. Right. And uh, I just wrote it off as a typo. And if I'd have read between the lines, they were trying to tell me I was being promoted if I'd get over there. Right. <laughs> you know, so I should have went. should have went. Did you move back into Licking County then and start truck driving? Or? No, I stayed in El Paso, okay. and uh, I drove U.S. mail for a while. Uh, a couple of years, I drove for a company called uh, Elbar. Mm -hmm. It used to be Crowbar, Frank Crowmain in Dallas, Texas only. Okay. And uh, it was, he, he named different ones. He had Elbar in El Paso. Down in Cincinnati was Hart Co. He had a couple other container outfits that just carried cardboard boxes. And, uh, I forget what he called it now. But, uh, I drove for him for a while, and I got fired because I got caught with a CB radio in the truck. We weren't supposed to have them. He said they were a distraction and didn't want them in his trucks. Really? Yeah, I got fired for that. So I went to work for another guy and drove for him for a little while. And I started thinking about it. I said, you know, I said, this is crazy, so. Quit the truck driving, moved to uh, Odessa, Texas, was going to work in oil fields. And when I got down there, things was kind of playing out. And uh, I went to work for a propane company. And uh, well, actually, I worked several different places. I worked for two ready mix companies, and then I went to work for a propane company. Okay. The building and everything was slowing down. But the propane company, I knew there were people living there that were going to have to have heat. So. Right. <laughs> uh, I went and did a lot of studying. I was already an auto mechanic. I was a pretty good mechanic. Uh, I did some studying to figure out how to put these systems on, the propane systems on vehicles. And a lot of people were running propane. And uh, I seen an opportunity to not only kind of secure myself a good position, but better the company's mm -hmm. intake of money, you know. And right. Get, get a little more profit rolling there. And, uh, I went to El Paso to a two-week school since I lived. The wife was there. I lived had had a place to stay. I just stayed there. Right. Uh, I went to school for two weeks, and this guy from California come out from uh, Emco, makes propane products. Uh, they they put on the school, and they told us how to repair this and how to check different things and what kind of readings you should get. And the main thing was Ford had just come out with this feedback computer. Thing. And it was a pretty simple system, and uh, all it was was an O2 sensor and had a uh, reversible motor that controlled the fuel mixture. Okay. And uh, depending on how much O2 was in the exhaust system, would tell a computer, okay, you need to advance or retard the, the fuel mixture ratios. Right. And uh, it, was, it was pretty simple, but we had to tie that propane into that to make it work right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was the main thing that I learned in there was, was how to, to install that on the computer control system. Uh, Rogers Ford in Midland, Texas sold vehicles to the Texaco. And we installed, uh, I got contracts for Texaco and Gulf Oil. And uh, let's see, what else did I get? Frito Lay and Swan's Frozen Goods. I got contracts with all of them to install propane systems on the vehicles. So his cash flow shot through the oh, roof all of a sudden. Yeah, that's good. And uh, we, uh, we had a pickup come in and it ran sluggish. The first thing we did before we ever touched any one of the new pickups was drive, make sure everything was working right, and put a meter on it to make sure all these O2 levels and stuff, to make sure the computer's working right. Well, this one was sluggish. I put the meter on it and I said, this one's got to go back. Computer's bad on it. Took it to Ford, dropped it off, told him what was wrong. I said, the computer's bad on it. I hadn't even made it back to the shop, and uh, they called me. I said, you can come get this pickup. The boss called me on the radio, so I went back down and get it. I went down. 
He said, we adjust the carburetor. And I said, you can't adjust the carburetor on these. He said, there are no adjustments. So we adjusted this thing. And I said, well, you just messed up. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, well, how do you know so much about it? He said, we don't even know anything about these yet. And I said, I went to school for it. And uh, I said, let me go up to the shop and I'll get the meter and I'll show you what it's doing. I went up and got the meter, hooked it up and showed him what it was doing. And I said, your computer's not working. I said, see these lights? I said, they should be going back and forth, steady, <laughs> back and forth, making adjustments. And I said, it's doing nothing. He said, where'd you get that meter? I said, bought it from Emco. He said, well, how can we get one? I gave him the address and he said, how much is it? I said, $119. <laughs> <laughs> So they had no mechanics been to school yet. They'd come out with a new system right. that they knew absolutely nothing about. So he kept the truck. They finally got a computer for it. They put the computer in. And by that time, he had his meter. And uh, he hooked it up. And he seen what it was doing. He said, ah, okay. <laughs> it's pretty cool. But anyway, long story short, I, I stayed there for a good while. And, and I got the itch to drive again. And decided I was going to spend $3,000 make a down payment on a truck through North American van lines. I did that, and that turned out to be a nightmare. Uh, I made good money. I made $70,000 the first year, but I only got to keep 6500 of it. Wow. Uh, all the money went back in the truck, uh, $1,200 payments, uh, $1,200 insurance a month, $1,200 truck payment a month, had tires, uh, you know, tire repairs and stuff like that. Oil changes every every fifteen thousand miles. You change oil, you rack up about fifteen thousand miles in a week and a half. Wow. And about one hundred twenty dollars in oil change, so expenses add up quick. I guess and, uh, fuel had to buy your own fuel and everything. Uh, I mean, the pay was good, but the money going out was just as as much as you That's were making, pretty pretty close. So. I mean, by the time I had a few expenses to just be able to eat on the road and stuff, I didn't leave much to send to the family, and I said, no, I can't keep doing this. And it didn't get better the second year, so uh, about halfway into the third year, I said, that's it, I'm taking this thing back, and then you have it. I, don't, I can't, can't keep going like this. So I took it back, and then I stayed up here in Ohio and went to work for, uh, what's your name here, man? MPW. For them, and I stayed there for a good many years. Then, uh, like three years, and then I was coming up out of uh, West Virginia. I'd been to a power plant down in West Virginia on a job, and I was coming back. Instead of coming up 77, I decided to go up 60 in Zanesville. I said, It's Sunday, I said, I'm just kick back, take it easy, and enjoy the scenery. And uh, when I hit McConnellsville, there was a sign at the outskirts that says, Welcome to McConnellsville, the future home of the Hawk Missile. <laughs> As this looks like an opportunity knocking. <laughs> right. And uh, I went straight over here to North to the recruiter and, and uh, talked to him about uh, what what did I need to do. I said, I'm 39. I said, am I too old to get back in? And he says, well, he said, I don't think so. He says, uh, what do you got in mind? And I told him about that Hawk Missile unit. He says, what do you know about the Hawk? And I said, what do you want to know? <laughs> and... Uh, he said, well, what all did you do in there? I said, I was a fire control operator. I said, I was, I said, I was trained as a 16 Delta uh, Hawk missile crew. And I said, I can assemble the missile, test the missile, uh, put the missile on the launcher, launch the missile. I said, whatever you need done, I can repair the launcher, I can repair the radars. He says, sign right here. And <laughs> I signed on the dotted line. Within a month, I was full-time National Guard. And they sent me off to the NCO Cat Training Academy over at Rickenbacker. And... Uh, Put me through a, uh, I can't remember if that was just a week or two, I think it was a two week uh, training class to, to be certified as an instructor. And uh, so I went in, got all that taken care of, and, and was uh, teaching people on the weekends for the weekend drills and stuff. We had classes, and then uh, during our two week, well, actually, we were coming up on our two week when I come out of school. We were just coming up on our two week drill for the, mm -hmm. for the annual drill. And what we did is our tactical site wasn't prepared McConnellsville yet. They had some problems. The hillside was too muddy or something and they had to beef it up to keep things where it's supposed to be. <laughs> and and uh, it cost them some delays in construction. But uh, We had set up on the uh, state metal grounds at Cambridge. Okay. So 
Lake Mill Hospital out there. They had a big old field. And uh, our, our two-week training was to unpack everything, inventory, check to make sure there's no damage, no physical, you know, visual damage to any of the components. And then uh, after we did that, got everything pretty much set up, we, uh, and I went out and helped the guys, you know, show them what they had to do to cable everything up, how far it had to be from this and this. And I said, we're, we're limited on space here, trying to set up a whole battalion, so I said, we're going to have to kind of cut our distances down and just be more careful about the radars and stuff, making sure that you don't go blow any certain settings or whatever so you don't fry somebody <laughs> next door. <laughs> and because uh, the high power radar we had put out a beam about Oh, probably the size of a pencil, maybe a little bigger than a pencil. And it was like 15,000 watts. So it's a <laughs> wow. Microwave. Yeah. That would, that would definitely, I mean, uh, I've seen a guy in Germany actually did it. Uh, had a sheep sitting there getting nice and toasty warm in the middle of winter because he dropped that radar down and was pointing that beam at that sheep. <laughs> and uh, that poor old thing sitting there just getting, <laughs> getting all comfortable. And, uh, the old farmer probably have a bit because he'll never have lambs again. <laughs> Anyway, we had to be careful of that, but we, we set up there and, and uh, did training and stuff, and then uh, there was a low area that uh, we didn't know that the engineers had declared it a floodplain. It didn't show that on our maps that we had. We had one unit, one of the batteries was set up down that low area. And it just happened it was the night that I was on guard duty. We had, I forget how much, it was like an inch and a quarter of rain in two or three day period. The river started coming up. A little creek down there started coming up. And I called in and told them, I said, this water's coming up. I said, it's coming up fast. And they said, uh, is the equipment safe? And I said, it's not going to be if it continues at the rate it's going. I said, well, I, I said, I put a stick in the ground. I said, it's come up about three inches in the last hour and a half. I said, we need to do something. So they called and they got a hold of the engineers and they said, well, you're in a floodplain. They said, you got to get that stuff out of there. So that's going to flood. So it'll flood clear up to the, clear up to the, almost to the top of the bank there. So we had to hurry around. There was only two of us out there. We had to hurry and start pulling this equipment out. And uh, I said, just cap the ends of the cables and leave them for now. I said, if push comes to shove, I said, cables are cheaper to replace than all this other equipment. Is. I said, we need to get these pieces, these radars and launchers out of here first thing. So we got pretty much all of it moved. We had one launcher had a little water damage, not not severe. I mean, it dried out and still worked all right. right. We forgot to close the porting plugs in the bottom of the cabinet. We got to check them to make sure they were closed. And, uh, we started through and it shot up into the electronics cabinet. <laughs> wow. but, uh, that was the only piece that we, we had any damage to. We managed to get the cables and stuff out too. We had to wait around and find them. We just took them to the back of the truck and just drug them up out there because it's 375 feet long. Wow. So, pretty heavy stuff. But, uh, I wish I'd have stayed, but I got in trouble and that ended my military career. And the law didn't see eye to eye on some things. Yeah. <laughs> so, I was, I was wanting to stay, get my, I mean, I had 12 years in at that point. Want to get my other aid in and at least have some kind of a pension. But, uh, I guess it wasn't meant to be. I enjoyed the military. I really did. Mm -hmm. I, I, we had a lot of good times, a lot of good laughs. There were some sad times. Uh, I had a guy who was in my unit probably not more than a week and a half, maybe two weeks. Uh, he had come in and they think he was dealing drugs. They don't know for sure what happened, but he was found underneath the bridge by the Moselle River in downtown Trier. He had been shot and stabbed, uh -huh. and uh, that was pretty rough because I, I I can't even remember the guy's name to this day. And I'm I'm bad about remembering names. Right. But uh, we had to write me and the, the platoon sergeant and uh, the platoon leader, the lieutenant. We had to sit down and write a letter to his family. And that was that was probably the hardest thing I had to do oh, while I was in there. That was probably the hardest. Thing. How do you tell somebody that your son's just been killed and don't know why? Right. You know, really don't know why. I, the 
The only thing they could say is they, they speculated that it was a drug deal that gone awry. That's, that's all they would tell us. And the CID investigated. They didn't really uncover anything more than what the Germans had uncovered, which is what the authorities did. They ran their investigation. And that was all they could do was put killed for unknown reasons. That could be that he it could be that he'd been down there drinking and went up under that bridge to relieve himself uh, and yeah, I mean, was shot. Knows. He might have stumbled on something yeah. down there. I mean, be a shot and stabbed. That's you know that's kind of kind of a little overkill. Right. And, uh, just makes you wonder if he didn't just stumble on something and maybe mm -hmm. got killed. We'll never know. No. That's, that's between him and the man upstairs now. But. So now you're back in Lincoln County. Now I'm back in Lincoln County. Okay. And still love it here. It's a good place to live. It's a good place to have friends, you know. Just kick back and take it easy. There's a lot of things to see and do here. Uh, I still remember as a kid going down to the old stone quarry in Boso. And, and, uh, never went swimming because I never knew how to swim. I used to go fishing down there a lot. And, and then when I got older, we used to go there and have beer parties. And, <laughs> Now, now it's a bike path and a walking path. And, uh, the old tunnel's still there. Uh, found something on the end of that tunnel here one day that doesn't quite jive with what I saw in the books. The dates are different. One of them says that tunnel was built for something different and later used for the Urban Railroad. And uh, the, the, the date that I found on the end of the tunnel was 18... 89, I think, and it was a, forget what the initials was, but it was back where, uh, I think it was Franklin Roosevelt started the program, put people back to work, and had a, had a set of initials, and I can't remember what it was now. Right. Uh, it had those initials on, the, on there with that date. And I need to save some money, buy me another camera, I want to go down <laughs> and take some pictures of that, and uh, go up here and compare it to the, to the books, and see if we can get something corrected on that. <laughs> So you did you grow up in Hanover or yes old Hanover? Yes. Yeah, I was down in old Hanover. Uh, actually, after the flood of '59, uh, it was the second house as you go up the hill that I uh, grew up in. And uh, the guy I worked for, where I got all these injuries, he uh, he ran the brick plant. He managed that for till till he retired. Uh, up in Hanover, he, he'd been there since '50. He said he came up there 51 or 53, something like that. He moved to Hanover. He actually started out in Fallsburg. And he built a house in Hanover, and then he bought the old uh, Gibbon farm. Okay. He bought it, and that's where he lives now. And it's, it's, that's a piece of history in itself. The barn and the house was built in 1831. Wow. So, it's, it's a pretty old house, and Beautiful woodwork inside. I'm not sure what the flooring is. Uh, I want to say chestnut, but it doesn't have the, the, the worm holes in it like you usually see in chestnut. Right. But it's uh, it's kind of colored that color. Somebody could have stained it somewhere over the years. I don't know. It's got the wide, wide board flooring in it and, and big old tall <laughs> baseboards yeah. and stuff. I mean, it's beautiful inside. I bet. And it's kept it pretty well preserved since he's been there. They, they call it the Senator's Senator's Lodge. He's got a sign outside. He's had some dignitaries that's come and stayed there for the weekends and stuff and had some of their meetings there. He's he's pretty pretty strong in the Republican Party and, and uh, so he's had some doings there off and over the years. And he's he's getting up in age and I still help him on the farm to keep things moving. Uh, his son has to work he works construction there in the Weather one it's permitted. Mm -hmm. uh, Dean's, I think he'll be eighty, either eighty six or eighty seven this year, in March. And, uh, his birthday is just a few days before mine. His is the fourteenth, and mine's the twenty second. So just a few days apart. But he's a pretty good man. And, uh, he knows a lot about about the area. I've been trying to get him to come in here and share some of his stories uh, on Facebook. Yeah. They've got that Hanover uh, page on Facebook, and I've been trying to get him to share some of that. He, somebody had asked about Bill Giffen. Mm, I and, remember uh, seeing that because I'm on that. 
And, yeah, and, and I'll put the thing on there. Dean had told me the story. Now, whether it's 100% accurate or not, I'm not sure, because Dean likes to embellish a little bit <laughs> once in a while. But, uh, the story he told me was that he was not related to Bill Giffen. Uh, James Giffen was the one who printed the money. He had a garage behind his house that's right on the corner of Hickman Road and Wicking Valley Road. 668, right, right across from the gas station. And he got caught. He was printing $20 bills. Uh, he got caught. Did two years in the federal penitentiary. Now, the question was, did he go to work for the government after that printing money? No, he did not. He actually, now this is what Dean told me, he actually went to Owens Corning in Rochester, New York, I believe what he said it was. Uh, they had a baby bottle machine. Yeah. So they were having trouble with it. They were only getting like, out of five bottles on this machine, they were only getting one or two good ones out of, out of every five. And uh, I guess Giffen walked up and looked at that machine. He said, you know, he said, I can build you one of those machines and it'll make a perfect bottle. It'll make six at a time and every one of them will be perfect every time. And uh, they said, what makes you think you can do that? He said, I'm, I'm just telling you I can do it. And uh, I guess they hired him to do that. He made the machines, and then they let him go after he made the machines. You're kidding me. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Dean said anyway. I don't know. But it was an interesting story that, you know, because I, I, I had heard that as a kid. And I'd heard people talking about him making the money and, and uh, going on to work for the government, printing mm -hmm. money. And, and Dean said, no, he said, he, he did his two years, and then he went to work for Owens Corning up in New York, upstate New York somewhere. It's funny how things get changed so, around. And, yeah, it's kind of like the old telephone thing yeah. in school. It starts out, uh, the cat chased the dog, and the time you get to the other end, it was uh, the cat ate the dog, right. or the cat killed the dog and ate the dog, or right. something like that. I mean, yeah, you're right. Yeah, it's kind of it's kind of odd. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed the military. It was it was a great experience, and uh, I actually hated to see them as much as I hate to say this. I actually hated to see them stop the draft. I think back then you had more diversity in the military. You had all walks of life there, you had all different levels of education, all different kinds of ideas, and if something stopped working, you put your heads together, you could make it work again. I mean, it was as simple as that. Right. And, and today, you're getting people that pretty much know how to do things on a computer and push a button, but when it comes down to the mechanical abilities, how much do they really know? I mean, we had uh, a warrant officer, my, see, yeah, that was the second time I was in Korea. Uh, we had a warrant officer there. The, the first sergeant that was there knew me from uh, El Paso and his unit. Okay. And I was his motor sergeant. When I got to that unit, I was in battalion headquarters. And I was supposed to be going to another unit. I was supposed to be going to Charlie Battery or something like that. And uh, I was up in Seoul. And I said, okay, I said, uh, well, what are you going to do with me? Then if you don't have any place for me, what are you going to do with me? And, and the Sergeant Major was there, and, and he said, well, he said, I really don't know what I'm going to do with you. I said, well, I need to go somewhere. And I heard this voice in the background says, is that my motor daddy? <laughs> and I turned around and looked, and I said, Nathan, and I can't remember his last name to this day, but it was uh, First Sergeant Nathan Can't think of his last name, but anyway, he was he was standing there with his hands on his hips, and he looked at Sergeant Major, and he said, "Sergeant Major," he said, "I don't have a motor sergeant." He said, "I know Sergeant Kenoy is a good motor sergeant." He said, "I need a motor daddy bad." <laughs> so Sergeant Major says, "Okay, if you want him, he's yours." <laughs> so I grabbed my duffel bag and I jumped in the jeep with him, and off we went to Shangri. <laughs> and uh, we got there, and he said. He said, oh, he said, I'll more warn you about this foreign officer down there. He said, he thinks he's God. He says, so brace yourself. And I said, oh, I said, I think I can deal with him. So next morning, I got settled in. The next morning, I went down to check out the motor pool. Here's this foreign officer we was talking about. And uh, he handed me a head gasket set. And I said, what am I supposed to do with this? I said, I'm putting it in supply back in, back in storage or Put it on the vehicle. What's what am I supposed to do with it? He said, "You're gonna put it on that vehicle over there." 
No, I'm thinking, okay, he wants to see what I know, so I'm going to impress the guy. I already knew in my head how to do it. I got the book out, turned it to the proper page, glanced over at it every once in a while to kind of impress him, and I went out and I put this thing together. And it come down to adjusting the valves, and it says to adjust the uh, intakes at 14, no, the intakes were adjusted at 10, the exhaust was adjusted at 14 thousandths. And the, the mechanical valves, and not hydraulic. So I'm over there, and I've got the valve adjustment tool, and I'm sitting there, and i got the feeler gauge. He comes out there and says, no, 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 you're doing that all wrong. I said, what do you mean I'm doing that all wrong? He says, you adjust them. He said, you put a torque wrench on there, and you torque all them down to 14 inch pounds. Do what? Well, you just do what I'm telling you. He said, okay, it's your funeral. <laughs> Adjusting them all down like he told me. And uh, when I went back and looked at the book, what he saw was if you adjust the valve cover nuts, you hold the valve cover on for 14 inch pounds. And uh, I said, okay, you start it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not touching it. And uh, needless to say, after I reported that to the first sergeant, he reported it to the battery commander, Mr. Maycomber was his name, I finally thought of his name, uh, was on the bus headed out of town. <laughs> wow. He said, we don't need somebody like that. And I said, well, I said, that's college education for you. I said, they can read the book, but can they do the job? Right. <laughs> you know, I said, that's all to me is the college education says that they can read it in a book. Mm -hmm. I said, hands on is a whole different ball game. And, and he asked me, he said, well, where'd you learn to do mechanics? And I said, well, actually, I pretty much taught myself. I said, I started out messing around with lawnmowers in the community. And uh, I said, started with my stepdad's. I said, he bought a real mower and an oxen sale. And I said, fairly new one. And I said, I took the motor apart to see what made it run. <laughs> and uh, he come home from work and his motor scattered all over the garage floor. And uh, he's screaming and hollering at me, it'll never work right again. He says, why did you do that? <laughs> and uh, I put it back together and, and uh, I'm perfect. And, uh, that's where I started. And after that, I said, well, there's nothing to these things. So People start having trouble with their lawn mowers and things. I take them in, I work on them, take them back to them, make a dollar or two here and there. And, and uh, I think by the time I was 14, I started working around with other people under the hoods, just kind of watching. I used to go over here to Arizona's Baker, mm -hmm. Arizona Baker, and uh, they had a guy there, Rocky, worked in there. And uh, I was always picking his brain about stuff. He'd tell me, and Dad'd say, you leave him alone. He's got work to do, right? He'd say, you just be quiet and let this boy learn something. <laughs> and uh, he, he passed away here about well, five or six years ago. Yeah. He was a good man. He, uh, actually, my mom treated him out at the uh, it's the health department now. It used to be in the TV sanatorium. She actually treated him or, or took care of him as a nurse out there while he was in the sanitarium. And uh, she, he always said, that was his favorite lady, so she always fed him good. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, I, I, I just kind of learned just watching people and, and helping them where I could. And, uh, just, like I said, I sort of taught myself. And by the time I was 16, I overhauled my first engine by myself. Uh, wow. A 57 Chevy that Dad had got for me. Things smoked. And I wanted to put new rings and stuff in it, so I put rings, bearings, gaskets in it, steel. Put it back together, and he said it'll never run again. About oh, four o'clock in the morning, I pulled up by his bedroom window in front of the house, and I just popped the clutch and let the tire smoke for a little while, and <laughs> let him know that it was running. <laughs> wow! But uh, you've got a mechanical aptitude. Cause yes, I I can I could watch somebody do all that, and there's no way I could do it. But I I worked at. Uh, after I got out of jail, I worked at TCI for a while. And uh, Mike Stickle, he's a, a heck of a nice man. I mean, he's a pillar of the community, I would say. Uh, he was downtown when, I forget what it used to be called. It, was, it wasn't TCI then, I don't think. It wasn't North Tower, because they're still there. So it might have been TCI, but he was down here, I think, on 3rd Street. 3rd or 4th, I can't remember where. I can't remember where they were. Anyway, they moved out to... Uh, across from Walker and Batat, and uh, Matthews Ford now. And uh, I went to work for him. He treated us good. I mean, we didn't make a lot of money. He said, you know, we just 
don't have a lot. Michelin had just bought them out. And uh, I'd been working, I think, about two years, and he had us on what he called a 7 7 plan. It was $7 an hour, 7% commission on parts and labor, which, if you don't, you got a big job, you can make pretty good money on it. Uh, I overheard him talking to one of the representatives for Michelin. They came in there and told him that you could no longer run your business the way you've been running it. You have to do it our way. And Mike says, I have been running this business for 42 years. He said, we have never been in the red. Our investors are very happy. They're well pleased with, with the way things go here. And they said, well, you're going to have to do it our way. He said, this thing of extending people 30, 60, 90 days, same as cash, has got to stop. So if they need money, they'll have to go to a loan company like anybody else. Mike told him, he said, you need to understand the community. He said, we have a lot of retirees here. We have a lot of people on welfare here. He said, there's not many jobs in this area. He said, there's a few of them moving up here. But he says, a lot of jobs left this area. And he says, left a lot of people without. And uh, he says, but the welfare, the farmers, and, and the retirees, he said, that's pretty much what makes up Newark. He said, they can't, he said, the farmers, he said, they can't afford to just throw out a big chunk of money at one time for repair. He said, they got money invested in livestock and grain, equipment, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, he, he put it on them just like it is. And uh, they said, well, you're going to have to do it our way. And Mike said, well, actually, he says, here's the alternative. He said, what you need to do is find somebody. You need to have me here by the end of the month because I'm just leaving. He said, I'm retiring. I heard that. I started looking for another job because I knew where I was at. Right. I mean, that's, he he kept that place so busy that we couldn't keep our heads above water. I mean, it stayed busy. And uh, I went to work for Sunfield. That wasn't the best of choices, but it was a job. It was ten dollars an hour, ten and a quarter an hour. It was better than what I was making. But long hours, hot, yeah. boring. <laughs> Standing there watching the machine stamp out metal all day long. Got hurt three times in four years. Wow. I probably took early retirement just to get away from that, just, just to get away from the injuries. So what do I do? I go out on the farm and <laughs> cut a finger off and <laughs> end up with a broken wrist. But uh, I like it here in Licking County. It's a great place to live. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say they don't like Licking County, that uh, you don't get a fair shake here. Well, yeah, you get a fair shake. You get what you ask for. Yeah. I, mean, uh, I, I can't complain. Strong military history. I mean, I know there's been a lot of people out of different wars. I mean, uh, I've had family members, uh, what, three of them that's, that was in the war. Actually, four of them were in the war. I forgot about Gene. Uh, my stepdad's brother, mm -hmm. Gene, he was he was also in the Second World War. Mm -hmm. uh, that's another story. Uh, my ex fiance now asked me if I knew how to play euchre. Yeah, I can play you. She said, well, good. So this old guy down on the square, uh, Gene, said, he taught me how to play. She said, well, I have to play sometime. I said, you talking about Gene, boy? She says, yeah, you know Gene? I said, yeah, it's my uncle. It's kind of a small world, I mean. You know, yeah. He used to spend a lot of his time down on the square playing cards. But he, uh, he passed away. All, all, well, all my stepdad's side of the family, except his sister, has passed away now. Got one sister left up in New Hampshire, and uh, but all the rest of them it was her and six boys. You know, and the six boys are all gone now. So it's been tough. Yeah. It's really hard on me the last couple of years. Uh, lost. Uh, I lost a brother that was 41 years old to cancer. I lost a sister that was 58 or 59 to cancer. Uh, then I lost. Mother, like three years ago, two years ago, I lost my oldest sister, and a week later, I lost my stepdad. So, wow. in the last three, three or four years, I lost everybody. A pretty good chunk of my family. Right. And I've got a niece. I just found out she's living down here on Fourth Street, not too far from me. I haven't talked to her in a while. My ex fiance didn't want me talking to her. I thought there was something going on between us, but. <laughs> I said, yeah, we're family. I said, right. what do you think's going on? You know? but, uh, uh, 
That's all water under the bridge. She's moved out of the county. She was one of them didn't like Lincoln County. Couldn't make it get out of here. She stayed in trouble with the law off and on. It's all because of her mental state. So. But, uh, well, I appreciate you coming in and sharing all that. I can't think much more. I mean, other than Tobosa, I mean, that, that place is rich in history, and I'm, I'm hoping maybe in early spring before the weeds and stuff get too high to take a walk back. So I think it was, was it White, White City? I can't remember down at Tobosa. I don't to, know. It used to be a town that was down by the Natural Rock Dam in uh, White Village or something like that. I can't remember. White's Village, maybe it was. But there used to be a little village down in there. And uh, there's a rock. There's still one of the locks there from the canal. And the interesting part, and one that people don't see a whole lot unless they go back on the bike trail, is if you look straight across where the, where the gorge, where the handprint was supposed to be on the rock, if you look at the base of that real close, you'll see that they actually built the canal extending out to the river from the rock side. You can see where they placed the stones in to bring the canal around the outside of that rock. Wow. That was That's pretty interesting. It's still, it's, there's a pretty good chunk of it still there. And I'm not sure 100%, but after the flood of 59, I was down in there and I used to walk back through there with a rifle and groundhog gun mm -hmm. along, along the bank. And I could have sworn that the, what I saw was the handprint on that rock that everybody talked about. Where I said it left the handprint yeah. and the Indian went off the cliff. And uh, I could have sworn I saw that handprint on that rock. But when I went and got somebody and come back, I couldn't find the thing. It wasn't there. So I don't know if, I was just, if it was just my imagination running wild or if I actually did see it and, and just couldn't find it again. But wasn't where I was thinking that it was. I don't know. Right. But, uh, Have you talked to uh, Dan Fleming upstairs? Yeah. Okay. And you probably talked to Larry Stevens? Yeah. Uh, I haven't talked to him face to face. Okay. I'd like to. There's a lot of history there. Louis Armantrout, because he was, he was a neighbor. He lived two houses down from us. Uh, Daddy Cummins lived right across from us. I think he had one of the stores there in hand. He lived up on the hill right across the street from us. I remember I can still I can still picture some of the things in old Hanover, oh, even bad. though I was nine years old when most of it disappeared. Uh, nine or well, I was about ten to the time because right after the flood of '59, it came in and just started leveling everything. But uh, I can still remember Jenny Evans' store. I can remember the Methodist Church across the street from it. And if you come back to the uh, towards the old high school side of the bridge there was Satterfield's grocery and across from that was I, I can't remember it was like a little cafeteria or something mm -hmm. all the school kids hung out there for lunch and stuff mm -hmm. and after school uh, I think it was right next to it I can't remember if there was another little store in between there but I remember the post office and I remember as you went in the door there was a row of mailboxes you know, they had the old A B C D E F Right. Type locks on it, the combination locks, and uh, you went straight back. Part of the counter was for postal business, and then the other side had tobacco, had like cigars, chewing tobacco, <laughs> snuff, all that kind of stuff. And then down the wall, and it seemed like there was a shelf in the middle of the floor had had the big wide open mouth jars, yeah, uh, jaw breakers, old okay. round candies yep. and stuff. And uh, you'd get like three pieces of candy for a penny, uh, get five sticks of licorice for a penny. <laughs> I used, used to, I was all the time, Mom, I need those pennies. <laughs> right. I mean, you can get a bag full of candy for a nickel. I mean, you can come out of there and <laughs> sit pretty good. But I still remember all those. I remember the old fire department being there. I had one truck. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was. I remember Elmer Moore. That was a big event in Hanover because they moved his house, the, the brick house, if you go up, go up toward the brick plant, out of the bottom of Hanover, on the right-hand side, there's a vacant lot between two houses. And that first house past that vacant lot, the brick house was Elmer Moore's house. And they moved it, they put it on a truck and moved it up the hill. That was a big event. Oh, I bet. In Hanover, watching that house be moved like that. 
That'd be a big event now to see a house being moved like yeah. that. I mean, let alone that. He had, he had just built that right before the flood. And uh, he was, I'm not building other houses. We'll salvage this one. And, uh, so they, they jacked it up and moved it. Wow. And as far as I know, that's the only one they did that with. I remember the old Hanover Presbyterian Church. I think the two pine trees that used to stand on either side of it, I think they're still there. Yeah, you still remember that. <laughs> Sometime you need to sit down with Larry. Dad You'd have a good time. <laughs> I helped Dad tear down a house that was down near the tunnel. It wasn't the third of the tunnel. It was like maybe the third or fourth house back from the tunnel. They, they auctioned all them off. The government bought them all and auctioned them off. And uh, Dad got a bid on one of them. He wanted material to build a shed and a garage and a bunch of other stuff. So he, he bought one of those and tore it down. I went and helped him tear it down. I wasn't very old. I was probably more in the way than I was help. Yeah. <laughs> did find a twenty dollar bill in there. Really? Yeah. Well, I bought you a lot of candy. Yeah, one, of the, one of the upstairs one of the upstairs bedrooms had an old piece of linoleum in it. Dad said, Well, why don't you drag that up, rip that up off the floor and drag it down and take it outside. Throw it on that pile of stuff that was all burnt. And I pulled that thing back and there was a twenty dollar bill in it. <laughs> Well, I was rich. Oh, I'll bet. <laughs> <laughs> you say with penny candy and twenty dollar bill, you're you're oh, set yeah. good. Yeah, I think I think Jenny Evans got most of it. <laughs> I think she got most of it. 